بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, Welcome everyone to this uh, short seminar insha'Allah regarding how to perform um, Umrah um, Insha'Allah it shouldn't take too long uh, Normally when I do this it just take about one and a half hours But I've taken out all of the extra information uh, Information regarding Medina and so on I've taken all that out And uh, what we're going to focus on is the actual Umrah itself We'll quickly go over some of the main things outside of Umrah regarding Medina and Ziyarah and so on, but that'll be very short. Uh, we'll go through uh, the Umrah part itself. And I've tried to you know, not make it technical at all, all technical terms, Rukun, Wajib, or, you know, all these uh, terms, I've taken them all out, and I've tried to make it, make it as easy as possible so that you guys can follow along. Now, doing Umrah is not, it's not something hard. It is, it's very easy, and... In fact, it'll only take, you know, two hours maximum, uh, depending on the rush. That's all, uh, you know, so it's just, just two hours long. Hajj is a bit more difficult. Hajj is five days and that requires a lot more. As for Umrah, Umrah is not difficult at all. So if anybody is going for Umrah, then it just requires them to, uh, you know, maybe listen to the seminar and then just read up about it or reread these slides just before doing the Umrah. And it's not something difficult at all. Especially if you're going with a group or if you're going with somebody who's done it before, then it's not something difficult uh, whatsoever. So the first thing we want to talk about is the importance of Umrah. And I don't want to spend uh, too long on it. Um, but what I will mention is just these three points. The first, and something which a lot of people don't know regarding the ruling of Umrah. Umrah is an obligation. Umrah is something which is... Uh, Obligatory. A lot of people think a lot of people think it's just Hajj, which is obligatory, but the reality is is that uh, Umrah is also obligatory. Hajj is a pillar of Islam. Umrah is not a pillar of Islam. They are both obligatory, but the difference is Hajj is a pillar of Islam. Just like being good to your parents is obligatory as well. But it's not a pillar of Islam, right? Therefore, the ruling of Umrah is that Umrah is also wajib, obligatory at least once in a person's life. But it doesn't come under the pillar of Islam. So if a person misses it out, then it's not like he's missed out a pillar of Islam, like missing out Hajj or Salah or Zakah, but it is still something which is obligatory. That's why it should still be given a lot of importance. Obviously, the ultimate objective would be Hajj, but at the same time, the importance of Umrah should not be downplayed. Secondly, the virtues of Umrah are, uh, are many. I mean, there's so many ahadith, and I'll read a few out uh, to you right now which show the immense reward and virtue for a person who performs uh, Umrah. So for example, in a hadith uh, authenticated by Al-Bani, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Al-Hujjaj wal-Ummar wafad Allahu dua'a'um fa'ajabuhu wa sa'aluhu fa'ataahum. Those that do Hajj and those that do Umrah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts their dua and if they ask for anything, Allah gives it to them. That's why, you know, when people go for Hajj and Umrah, we normally say to them, make dua for us is because doing Hajj and doing Umrah is a means of a, du- a person's dua being accepted. Uh, in another hadith of Bukhari Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, Al Umrah to Al Umrah kafaratun lima baynahuma. One Umrah to another Umrah is an expiation of a person's sins for all those sins that take place between those two, two Umrahs. So, therefore, if a person constantly does Umrah and Umrah and Umrah, the sins that take place, the minor sins that take place in between, by that person performing Umrah, it's a means of his sins being uh, forgiven. In another hadith narrated by Ahmad and Tirmidhi and authenticated by Al-Albani, the Prophet ﷺ said, Tabi'u bayn al-Hajj wal-Umrah. Constantly uh, do Hajj and Umrah after one another. فَإِنَّهُمَا يَنْفِيَانِ الْفَقَرَ وَالذُّنُوبِ Because they negate poverty and they erase sins. كَمَا يَنْفِي الْكِيرِ خَبَثَ الْحَدِيدِ وَالذَّهَبَ الْفِضَّةِ وَلَيْسَ الْحَجِّ الْحَجَّةِ الْمَبْرُورَةِ ثَوَابًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ just as uh, when the blacksmith, he places the metal in the, in the furnace and it uh, destroys all of the impurities on there, just like that, Hajj and Umrah removes a person's sins. And then uh, the person f- finished off with a very you know, famous statement, uh, hadith regarding Hajj, that there is no ex- there's not any reward for an accepted Hajj except for paradise. Meaning if you do Hajj and it's accepted, then your reward will be paradise. And I have a list of you know, many uh, hadith and so on, the point being is that the virtues and the rewards that a person gains from doing, from doing Hajj and Umrah are, uh, are many. And lastly, uh, what shows the importance of Umrah is the location. 
which is which is Mecca, uh, and more specifically, Al Masjid Al Haram. And you know, if a person goes and he doesn't do anything apart from doing the Umrah and praying Salah in Al Masjid Al Haram, that's all he does. He doesn't do extra Quran or anything extra like that. He should be, but if he doesn't, even that would be enough. Because the salah, the reward of one salah in Masjid al-Haram in Mecca is equivalent to 100,000 salahs. SubhanAllah, imagine, Masjid al-Nabawi, the Prophet said, خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ صَلَاةٍ It is better than a thousand. One salah in Masjid al-Nabawi is not a thousand, better than a thousand, so more than a thousand. How many, how many days does it take to pray a thousand salahs? I don't know, you guys do the math. And what about Mecca when it's 100,000 salah? For every, you know, once, just one salah that you pray, you go just to pray Zuhr salah. You get, 100, you get the reward of 100,000 salahs. How many months, how many years would that take in, in, in UK? So subhanAllah, going for Umrah, a person attains all of these rewards and all of these uh, virtues. So therefore, you know, Alhamdulillah, Allah's blessed many people. You see them going for holidays to Dubai and all sorts, right? Every year. And there's nothing wrong with the person enjoying themselves and going to these places, but importance should be also be given to uh, Hajj and, and Umrah. And the rewards are, are immense, you know. J- just, just take the reward of the Salah, just the Salah itself. Imagine 100,000 Salahs. You know, I, I don't know, anyone did the math so far? I don't know how many years uh, that is. Huh? What is it? Khas, you can work it out later. Okay, right, let's start with the actual Umrah. So after acknowledging the importance of Umrah and the reward that a person gains, right, how does a person do Umrah? Umrah, like I said, is very, very simple. It should take you, apart from the travel, obviously, apart from that, actually Umrah itself takes about two hours. If there's no rush, you can do it in like an hour or over an hour. Okay, nowadays because of the tourism, uh, the tourist visa and so on, there's a bit more rush. So about two hours and you should complete the whole thing. We can summarize it. I'm going to start off with a quick summary and then individually we'll go through each of, uh, each of the points, inshallah. Like I said, it's not difficult and don't worry, I'll revise it at the end as well. It can be a bit overwhelming the first time if you're doing it. Sometimes you know, people, they're a bit, uh, they don't want to mess up, but it's not difficult whatsoever. Right. We can summarize it in five main points. The first is ihram. What, what I'll do, I'll send these... Uh, I send these slides in the uh, in the group, inshallah, afterwards. So you don't need to take pictures. I send the whole thing, no problem. Um, the first is ihram. Okay, and in brackets I've written pillar, but we can ignore that for now. That's just some of the technical terms. Uh, if it says pillar, then, then you have to give it a bit more importance. Your, your umrah is not accepted without it. As for the others, there's a bit more leeway. Uh, but the first thing that a person does is ihram, and I'll explain what that means. Okay, uh, ihram. Simple terms: you wear your white uh, clothing and you make an intention for Umrah. That's what it is in simple terms. Then the second thing that a person does is Tawaf. Tawaf meaning going around the Kaaba seven times. So you reach Mecca, you do Tawaf around the Kaaba seven times. Then you pray two raka'at behind Maqam Ibrahim. Maqam Ibrahim, which is a yellow thing, which I'll show a picture in a, in a, in a, in a short while, inshallah. After you've done your Tawaf around the Kaaba, you pray two raka'at behind her. Then you do Sa'i between Safa and Marwa. Sa'i just mean, basically means you go from. Go from Safa Marwa seven times. And then after that, you have a haircut and your Umrah is finished. So what you do? You ihram, you go do tawaf, pray two raka'at, go between Safa and Marwa, have a haircut and your Umrah is finished. Okay? So it's not difficult whatsoever. Ihram, tawaf, two raka'at, uh, go in between Safa and Marwa, and then you finish with your haircut. As soon as you've had your haircut, uh, you finished your, uh, your Umrah. Okay, let's take it in a bit more detail now. Each one. Ihram. Firstly, ihram. Ihram, a lot of people think that it refers to the white clothing, uh, but that's not actually what the meaning of ihram is. But just to make it easier, ihram, we can say that ihram refers to two things. Firstly, it refers to the clothing. But the second thing is, it says here, the clothing of ihram and the state of ihram. That's very important. That's the main thing. And the reason it's the main thing is because if a person does umrah without wearing the white clothing, he gives a fidya and it's, you know, he pays the fidya and it's still accepted. But if a person does not enter into the state of ihram, then there's, there's no umrah whatsoever. So the main thing is the state or your intention, which I'll get to in a second. But obviously, the clothing is still important. Right, what is the clothing of ihram? It says here, so firstly, you want to prepare yourself for ihram. 
So before actually wearing the clothing, you can prepare yourself. So it's sunnah to what? You may perform a shower, clip your nails, trim your hairs, uh, your, you know, your, 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 your armpit hairs, your private hairs and so on. Uh, apply perfume to the body, not to the clothes. Uh, and all of this is part of the preparation. So this is all sunnah to do. So before you uh, enter into uh, ihram, you need to prepare yourself, no problem. Sunnah, go have your shower, uh, cut any nails that you need to, cut any hair that you need to. If you want to apply uh, some atar or some perfume, no problem, on your body only, not on your clothes. Not on the clothes whatsoever, it's not permissible on your clothes. But on your body, no problem. Now, um, we're going to talk about the miqat and, and stuff uh, in a second, where do you make your intention from. Obviously, if a person is going from the UK directly to Jeddah, then this preparation ideally should be done before you go on the plane because once you're on the plane, you won't have time to have a shower or anything like that after that. If you're in Medina, then you're, you're more relaxed. You can do all, all of this in the hotel. You can do it at the miqat, at the masjid, or you can do it at your hotel. It's not a problem. Okay? Most of the time, I do it from the hotel. It's just a lot easier and saves a lot of time. Okay. So this is all preparation before the ihram. Right. Now you want to wear the clothing of ihram. What is the clothing of ihram? The clothing of ihram for men is two plain unstitched cl uh, cloths. So all it is, it's just two cloths of, of, uh, of clothing. Nothing stitched. Stitched meaning there's no holes for your arms, there's no hole for legs. It's just two uh, pieces of cloth. That's all it is. And notice it doesn't even say white. It's not, it's not a condition for it to be white. However, because everyone wears white now, a person shouldn't you know, be standing up. That defeats the purpose. So uh, you, know, you, you wear white. But the actual condition is, is that it's two pieces of clothing that are plain, no designs, nothing that will attract any eyesight towards you and it's unstitched okay that's all it is two one for the bottom and one for one for one for the top okay so that means you're not allowed to wear any trousers underwear shirts anything covering the head no turbans no hats no shimar this is called shimar um, as for the footwear you can wear what you want as long as you're not covering your ankles and your heels okay so flip flops even normal sandals that just cover the, the top part of your uh, of your foot over your, your toes, that's fine. As long as you don't cover your, your heels. So, so those ankles, so those sandals that have straps and things like that, all of that should be uh, avoided. Obviously no socks and so on, all of that should be avoided. Just normal sandals, uh, that does the job. This is obviously the clothing for men. So what do men wear? Just two pieces of unstitched cloth. That's it, one for the bottom, one for the top. As for uh, women, women wear normal clothes. Women wear the normal clothes. The only thing they can't wear is gloves and the niqab. They can't wear the niqab. Now, if a woman still wants to cover her face, what she can do with her normal uh, hijab or her normal clothing, if you know any spare you know cloth which is coming out, she can use that to cover her face, like uh, the Pakistani way of doing niqab. That's 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 fine. As for having a separate cloth for the niqab, that is not something which is permissible for uh, for women. This is the clothing of ihram. Okay? So, the clothing of ihram, do we have a ihram, spare ihram? Huh? Uh, Awab, grant me that. Uh. I'll just take one out for now. As you can see, it's just one plain white cloth yeah that's all it is one plain white cloth now for men they just for men obviously the one on top just goes um, just goes over the top like that and you just uh, wear it like that as for the bottom then you just wrap it around you and you tie it and people have different ways of doing it and I'm sure there's many YouTube tutorials <laughs> on how to do it um, but it's not difficult whatsoever. You can just take it. One, two. I'll just wear it like this. And there. Uh, just. And it's fine. You can wear a belt. So somebody wants to wear a belt. So that it keeps the ihram on. And also you can put your phone and accessories. That's uh, permissible. Any other accessories. Watches you're allowed to wear. Uh, glasses you're allowed to wear. Accessories are allowed to wear. So that's it. So it's just one cloth on the bottom here. Um, and then you get the other one. And you just wear that. On top, that's it. Um, there is a part of the Umrah where you, the men, uncover the right shoulder. Don't worry about that. That is only done when you're about to do tawaf. So as for now, 
you, you know, you, you wear it and you, you cover yourself uh, properly. When salah time comes, make sure that your shoulders are covered. So some people, what they do is that they wear the ihram and uh, they just uncover their shoulder the whole way. And even if salat comes, then they still uncover their shoulder. That's not allowed. Uh, the Prophet said, there's no salah, laysa ala atiqihi shay in Sahih Muslim, is that, uh, you know, from the, there's, there's no salah for the person who doesn't have anything on their shoulders. I.e., a person should be covering their shoulders during the salah. So even if you're doing umrah, and you're doing tawaf, and you're meant to uncover, if salah time comes, for the salah, you uncover it again. And then you continue um, afterwards. Okay, there's some brothers talking at the back. Uh, people are complaining. Can you please stop talking? Oh, okay, those at the back. Quiet. Thank you. Right. Now you're... Uh, it says here, once you are prepared, uh, you will need to enter into the state of ihram. So remember I said ihram has two meanings. There's the clothing of ihram, then there's the state of ihram. What does it mean, the state of ihram? State of ihram, it basically means you're in the state of umrah. Right? So you might be wearing the clothing, but you're not in the state of Umrah. Because there's certain things you're not allowed to do. Okay? For example, you're not allowed to wear perfume. You're not allowed to cut your nails. You're not allowed to cut your hair. Right? If you're just wearing the clothing, if you're just wearing the clothing, um, but you've not entered into the state of Ihram, that's fine. You're, you're allowed to cut your nails. You're allowed to. So let's say, for example, you're in Medina, you're in the hotel. You've put on the Ihram. Now you've not actually made your intention for Umrah. It's fine. You're allowed to cut your nails. Okay? But once you enter into the state of ihram, that's it. You're in the state of umrah. Now there are a number of rules, a number of things that you're not allowed to do. Okay? It says here, uh, to enter the state of ihram or umrah, you have to make your intention from the miqat. Miqat is a place, a designated place where you make your uh, intention from, uh, which I've got a separate slide uh, for that. Now, it says here from the miqat, so the, that miqat that you go to, it's, it's a place, and I'll explain what the, you know, what the places are in, in the following slide, inshallah. It doesn't necessarily have to be from there. It can be before. So if you make an intention before the miqat, from your hotel room, that's fine as well. But the main point is that you can't go past the miqat except that you've made the intention. Okay? So let's say you're in Medina. The, the miqat of Medina is just in the outskirts of the Halifa. As long as either before that, i.e. from your hotel, on, as soon as you've left your hotel or at the masjid itself where the, uh, where the miqat is as long as you've made your intention there then that's fine but you're not allowed to go past the miqat without making the intention so you can't start driving and then you're about to enter Mecca like yeah I'll make the intention of Mecca no okay you have to make it from the uh, miqat itself right how, how does a person enter the state of ihram not difficult whatsoever all you say labbaik Allahumma umrah that's all you say. Which means, oh Allah, I'm here to perform Umrah. That's all a person says. I've written it there. لَبَيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ عُمْرَةً That's all a person says. Right? If you go to the actual miqad, there's a masjid, there's no harm. You can enter the masjid, pray to raka'at, nafal, uh, and then make the intention. That's, that's not a problem. Okay? The main thing is that you make your intention. You say لَبَيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ عُمْرَةً before you pass the miqad. So sometimes what happens, some uh, Umrah companies, or you know, we, we used to do it sometimes, it is a lot of rush at the miqat, you know, stopping, everyone getting off the coach, and then everyone praying to raka'at, making intention. It takes long, sometimes an hour, sometimes one and a half hours. So some people don't stop, they just drive past. And as they see the miqat, in the car, لَبَيْكَ اللَّهُمَ umra, And you continue, that's fine as well. The main thing is that you do not go past the miqat, which is the designated area, except that you make your intention. By saying, لَبَيْكَ اللَّهُمَ Umrah. Is that clear? Yeah? Right. After saying this, you are a muhrim, i.e. in the state of ihram. A muhrim is a person who has entered into the state of ihram, entered into the state of, of umrah. Now that you are a muhrim, what does that mean? This means from now on you cannot wear any of the forbidden clothing. So any of, uh, anything which opposes the plain unstitched clothing. So you can't wear any trousers, any underwear, any t-shirts, any, all of those things that we said you can't wear. From once you've entered the ihram, you're not allowed to wear it whatsoever. Uh, you're not allowed to cl clip your nails, you're not allowed to trim your hair, you're not allowed to apply perfume anywhere in your body or on the clothes. Once you're in the state of ihram, no more perfume. That's it. Uh, no, are you allowed to engage in any sexual behavior? Right? Um, if there's a lot of rush 
let's say during tawaf and a person wants to maybe uh, let's say want to hold their women folk protect them from being squashed or whatever that's fine or hold their hand to make sure that they don't go uh, you know they don't get lost that's fine okay but obviously what's understood by sexual behavior is uh, clear so that is not allowed whilst a person is a state of of a haram now that you understand the state of haram let's say you're traveling to uh, to Mecca what does a person do you're in the state of haram you're in the state of umrah a person shouldn't waste any of their time uh, in vain talk in useless talk in gossip none of that the only thing a person should be saying is the talbiyah the talbiyah which is labbayk allahumma labbayk labbayk la sharika lak labbayk inna alhamda wa ni'mata lak wal mulk la sharika lak a person just constantly repeats this again and again and again and again all the way until they enter Mecca once you start seeing the houses of Mecca and you enter into Mecca then you stop so at the masjid you don't need to say it you, know, you say it until you enter Mecca once you've entered into Mecca you start seeing the houses of Mecca the buildings the hotels the, then you uh, then you stop but until there you say it the men say it out loud and the women say it quietly you don't say it in one voice you find sometimes everyone that says it in one voice um, that's not something which is legislated everyone just says it if it ends up corresponding with somebody else's voice and you end up saying it together no problem but it's not something which should be you know, intended from the get go that everyone come and let's say in the same voice that's not something that the Prophet nor the Sahaba nor the Salaf did you just say it yourself if you end up saying it the same as somebody else uh, no problem okay so you keep saying labayk allahumma labayk which basically means oh Allah I'm here labayk la sharika lak labayk oh Allah I'm here to perform umrah that you have no partner whatsoever in alhamda wa ni'mata lak wal mulk all praise all blessings all uh, kingdomship belongs to you only oh Allah la sharika lak you have no uh, partner in that and you'll find subhanallah the, the, the journey of hajj and umrah is a journey of tawheed the oneness of Allah everything that a person does just shows that we are slaves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. We wear the same clothing because there's no difference. We're all slaves of Allah. Even the things that we say, as you can see, just shows that we are going because we are slaves of Allah and we are uh, going to perform and to fulfill the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Even once we get to um, uh, the two raka'at behind Maqam Ibrahim, the hadith Jabir, the, the, he mentions that the sunnah surah to recite is surah to ikhlas and surah al-kafirun. And in the hadith he says, فَقَرَأَ فِيهِمَا بِالتَّوْحِيدِ The two raka'at, the Prophet recited at tawheed meaning Surah Kafirun, Surah Ikhlas. Surah Kafirun shows that we are free from shirk, and Surah Ikhlas shows that we are firm, tawheed sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. So we have the, uh, this talbiyah, لَبَيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَيْكَ that a person says. Now, this is one of the du'as, one of the adhkar, the dhikrs that a person says. From the you know, ease of Umrah is that throughout the whole Umrah there's not actually anything specific that a person needs to say apart from one or two things here and there. Like saying, uh, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, doing tawaf and so on. Otherwise, if a person just remains silent the whole way, his Umrah will be accepted. Yeah, so if you go all the way to Makkah and you don't say anything, you sleep. Okay? And whilst during, during tawaf, you don't say anything, you just daydream. I don't know if I... You know, there's no point spending all that money going that far to daydream. But if any person ends up doing that, he doesn't say anything. And like you're doing sa'i, but he does all of the actions, his umrah is accepted, his umrah is complete. However, obviously, a person wants the most amount of reward, most amount of benefit from that trip. So, a person before going needs to learn all the adhkar and du'as that he needs to say. Okay, not only for umrah, even outside the umrah, like janaza du'as. After, after nearly every salah, uh, there's like a janazah salah. You need to know how to pray janazah salah. They don't say the janazah Allah like we do here. I'll explain it. I've added it at the end. Okay? But from now, let's say you're going for Umrah, from now you need to start preparing, memorizing these du'as. Because honestly, what happens once you get there, sometimes the first person may feel overwhelmed and he forgets everything. So if you're not prepared properly, then um, uh, you're going to end up wasting all that time and effort that you've, uh, that you've put in. Now, where can a person learn all of these du'as? Now there's many books, many leaflets, many apps and so on that will have all of the du'as. One of the best ones is a book called Hisn al-Muslim, Fortress of a Muslim. A very short, small book, you can get a pocket-sized book as well. That basically has all the du'as that Muslims need generally. On a day-to-day basis, entering the masjid, leaving the masjid, eating, after eating, before eating, uh, du'as during salah, after salah, everything's in there. And from the things which are in there are the, uh, all the du'as during 
حج عمره during حج عمره so the talbiya would be in the the dua uh, between the Yemeni corner and the black stone the dua safa marwa uh, everything else is all in there inshallah so if you just take that with you then everything is there in one place and also extra duas that you need throughout the uh, that you need throughout the trip entering the masjid leaving the masjid uh, with wudu and, and so on so it's a good book to get so instead of me listing all of the duas right I've just told you a book and there's also an app for it as well it's free uh, and there's many other apps as well which are good any of them would work just download them so you have them all with you at all times whenever you need it it's there, you're not asking around what's a dua for this, what's a dua for this, and so on. Right, what is a miqat? Remember I mentioned to you that you have to make your intention uh, for umrah at the miqat. Now, miqat are five designated places. Four of them were mentioned by the Prophet ﷺ, one, one was mentioned by Umar radiallahu an. And depending on where you are coming from, depending on where you are entering from, at the miqat, that's where you make your intention. The furthest one you can see here, it says Dhul Hulayfa, the one at the top, that's Medina. That's where Medina is, that's the furthest one. Okay? And then depending on where you're entering from, right? As long as before the Miqat you make your intention, it's fine. Right? Now, for people in the UK, there's just there's two main ones. Right? Either you're going from Medina, so that's quite straightforward before you leave the city, or at the Miqat, um, you make your intention. Or if you go directly to Mecca from UK, then about half an hour before reaching Jeddah airport, right, uh, that's when the Miqat enters. So if you're going on Saudi Airlines, then generally they announce it. Uh, the other airlines, you can ask them if they don't know, about half an hour before, and if you want to be safe, even an hour before, before then you need to make your intention. So you need to wear the clothes either at the airport or if you feel a bit awkward, then no problem. You can go into the bathroom at the, uh, on the aeroplane and change into your ihram. And then before you cross the miqat, make sure you make your intention. And you say, all you have to say is, لبيك اللهم umrah," And you're in the state of ihram. Okay? Don't wait for the plane to land. Because if you do, then, the, 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 then it gets a bit problematic. Then uh, you have to send you back and you have to go here, you have to take a taxi here and then separate from the group. And it, it gets a bit messy. Okay? So make sure you're paying attention. Even if you make the intention from Heathrow Airport or Manchester Airport here, that's fine. So if you feel like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm knackered, I'm going to probably fall asleep. Yeah, you can make an intention for the airport and that's fine. But then from the airport, you're not allowed to cut your nails, you're not allowed to, uh, you know, from there, that's when your state of ihram starts. Yeah, so Saudi Airlines, did they announce it? Other airlines, I'm not sure, you'll have to ask the airlines. Okay, but if they don't announce it, generally half an hour before you reach in Jeddah, that's when you cross the Miqat. Uh, maybe an hour before if you want to make your intention to be safer uh, that's fine as well okay now we've won our ihram we're in the state of ihram all the way and now we're entering into Makkah right what do we do when we enter into Makkah it's not a condition for you to go to the masjid straight away you can take your time you can relax once I keep writing one right, I'll change that on Sunday once you've reached Makkah you can prepare for Umrah Meaning you can go to your hotel, relax, rest, freshen up, and look for any convenient time to perform your umrah. No problem. You go to your hotel, get your rooms, put your, whole, uh, your luggage down. If you're really tired, let's say you've reached 11 p.m., 10, 12 o'clock at night, you want to sleep and do it after Fajr, no problem. Okay? You can take your time. Uh, most people, they just want to, you know, especially if you're going from, from Medina, you've already done a five-hour uh, travel, you're tired, people want to get... Normally get it over and done with, that's no problem as well. It's completely up to you when you want to do it. But once you've decided that you want to perform Umrah, you head towards the masjid, enter the masjid, make the dua. Uh, just like any other normal masjid. When you enter uh, Masjid Al-Haram, Mecca, Masjid Nabawi, there's no specific dua. It's a masjid. The normal dua that you read for a masjid, you read that dua for entering into the masjid. Then you head to the Mataf area. The Mataf area, is the area of tawaf. So you know the, the uh, right in front of the Kaaba, people are doing tawaf, that area is called mataf. Now they've expanded, there's also behind it, there's a level one, and there's a level two, and you, you, but they're a lot, uh, they're a lot longer, they, they, they take a lot longer. Um, now with the new restrictions and everything, they only allow those to do tawaf at the Kaaba, those who are doing, doing umrah. 
Meaning if you're wearing the ihram, they'll let you go in there. If you're wearing normal clothing, they won't let you go in there. Okay? Because obviously, between the people, the rest of the people, they'll send them to the first floor. They'll send them to the first floor, which you can still, you can still do it, but it is, it is a bit longer. It's a bit more difficult. Obviously, at the Mataf area, obviously the closer you are, the shorter the, and smaller the circles are, so therefore, uh, generally, the quicker you would do it. Um, if you go and if you're going straight to do Umrah and Tawaf, then you don't need to pray two raka'at for entering the masjid. Because the, the Tawaf itself takes the place of the two raka'at for entering the masjid in Masjid al Haram. If you want to enter the masjid and sit down for a while, maybe you're waiting for someone, then you pray two raka'at. If you're going directly to do Tawaf, then it, it, uh, you don't need to pray two raka'at. You can go straight to the Tawaf area. Right? Once you've entered the Mataf area, uncover your right shoulders. So notice, there's no uncovering of the right shoulder, even when you enter the masjid. When do you uncover your right shoulder? Once you've entered the area of Tawaf. So basically, just before you're about to start, just before you're about to start, that's when now you cover your right shoulder. And how does a person cover the right shoulder? Very simple. So normally you will have your, you'll have your ihram like this, right? Let's say you just, you're wearing it like this. All that person does is that he takes the right side, puts it under his right armpit, and he gets it and flicks it over the, the left shoulder. That's it. So you just uncover your right arm like that. The rest is still, is still covered. And normally you make the left side a bit shorter so that you have more to throw over. So, yeah, like that. You can just still cover yourself. The only thing uncovered is your, is your right shoulder. This is uncovered when? Only during the tawaf. So once you've entered into that mataf area, you can uncover it just before you start. And then once you've finished uh, doing the tawaf, uh, then you, you uncover it again. Okay? If, actually this will come now. Uh, then you can start your tawaf once you've reached the black stone. Right, now, you can't actually see in this picture. The black stone is right next to, to the door of the Kaaba. Once you reach the black stone, let's say this is the Kaaba, right? Let's say this is the black stone, here. If you're walking, entering from here, a lot of people enter from here because that's where the clock tower is and so on. As soon as you enter the Mataf area, you can cover your right shoulder, and you've not started at Wafi, you've not started, you've not started, you've not started. Now here, once you're here in line with the black stone, here you start, you say Bismillah Akbar and your Tawaf has started. Now, what you do, number one, it says, kiss the black stone. So the best thing to do is if you're able to, you go kiss the black stone. But let me be honest, it's, it's, it's like a jungle, it's like a, it's like a war over there, yeah? Uh, so if you're doing Umrah the first time, I wouldn't advise trying to uh, kiss the black stone. Uh, sisters, definitely, no matter what situation, I would never advise you to go try to kiss the black stone. Because men come out dying, what about the sisters? Right? Honestly, when you go there, it's, it's very, very difficult. A lot of pushing, shoving, and then you'll get you know, some big people as well. The Uthman, Hafizullah, right? And then if you've got people like that pushing and shoving you, you know, the, the men are struggling. A lot of the time the women go, the hijabs are pulled off. Uh, one brother told me that he went, he saw, he saw three women in front of him faint and they had to push them out. Right? It's very, very difficult. It's not something which is, oh, let me go for a nice stroll. It, it sounds nice. Everyone wants to kiss the black stone. But realistic speaking, it's very, very difficult. Okay? So especially during the Umrah, yeah, be very careful. So if you can't kiss the black stone, what do you do? You try to touch the black stone. If you can't touch the black stone, you, have, you get an object, for example, you have a stick, and you touch the black stone with that. These three options... Nowadays, it's very, very difficult. And if you can't do it, no problem whatsoever. All that person does is number four, which is that you point to it. So, the black stone, like I said, was here. Let's say you're over here. Right, once you're in line with the black stone, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, move on. You don't even need to stop. Whilst you're walking, you say Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. A lot of people stop, which causes a lot of more uh, traffic. You don't need to stop. Just Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, and carry on moving. Now, there are, it says here, green lights. So, what they've done is that uh, um, not in the actual Mataf area, but at the, once the building starts again, they've placed these green lights on each floor. Those green lights basically indicate that you're in line with the, with the black stone. So let's say you're quite far, you're 10 meters away, 20 meters away, you can't see the black stone. So you're thinking, oh, I don't know. No problem, just look at the green lights. As soon as you're in line with the green light, Bismillah, Allah Akbar, and you start your tawaf. So...
Yeah, there's tiles, but the amount of people there are, it's very difficult to see those tiles now. Okay? Uh, but yeah, if you can see the, the, any sign, no problem. But the easiest is just a green light. Just look, green light, and you see the black stone. You point with your right hand. You point with your hand. So you just point towards the black stone, Bismillah, Allah Akbar, and now you've started your tawaf. How many times do you go around the Kaaba? We go around seven times. Okay? Seven rounds. Now, now that you're going around the, uh, the Kaaba, there's no specific dua to say. Right? Just make your own dua, do your own adhkar, and so on. Uh, apart from the, there's one area that there is a specific dua, which I'll get to on the next slide. The first three rounds out of the seven is sunnah for the men to walk fast. It's sunnah for the men to walk fast. Not sprint, okay? And not, not necessarily have to be a jog, but like, a, you know, a quick, uh, brisk, or uh, basically walking fast, right? But with the condition is that you're not harming anyone. All of this, what I'm mentioning, the condition is that you don't harm anyone. So if there's a lot of people, and by you trying to walk fast, you're going to end up bumping into people, right? Don't. Just, just walk normally. Or if you've got family with you, and you can't leave them, no problem. Just, just, just walk. It's not a, a condition or anything. It's just sunnah to do if you have the ability to do so. If you don't have the ability, then that's it. You don't, you don't need to do it. Okay? Um, now, every time you go past the black stone, you just point to it, you say, Allahu Akbar. The first time you say, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. After that, you just say, uh, Allahu Akbar, and that's fine. Uh, there's no specific dua, busy yourself with that which is beneficial. Fast walking in the first three rounds, if, if possible, for men. So I just made this just before the salah. So For men. Right. Between the Yemeni corner and the black stone. Right. This was the black stone, right? This was the black stone. The corner before it is known as the Yemeni corner. The corner before the black stone is known as the Yemeni corner. Between the Yemeni corner and the Yemeni corner, subhanAllah, I don't know if they designed it like this, it's actually right in line with the clock tower. So the clock tower has got nothing, no, no Islamic value to it whatsoever, but it's right in line with it. So sometimes it helps. If you see the clock tower, right, you know you're in line with the Yemeni corner. The Yemeni corner, if you're able to touch it, it's soon not to touch it. If you're not, which is most likely the case, no problem, you can just walk around it, okay? Now between the Yemeni corner and the black stone, which is the last quarter of your tawaf, of, of your circulation, right? It's sunnah to recite the dua, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi l'akhirati hasana wa qina azab al-nar. Okay? So during the whole tawaf, you can say whatever you want. Even during that part, you can say whatever you want. But if you want to follow the sunnah, then you say, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi l'akhirati hasana wa qina azab al-nar. Okay? So a person says that just in that last court, uh, quarter, which is between the Yemeni corner and the black stone. Another way to recognize the Yemeni corner is that they've actually got this yellow golden strip, like this design coming down on that corner. If you go into the previous picture, yeah, there's no strip, okay? There's obviously the gold design going horizontally, but vertically you can't see anything. The Yemeni corner is on the other side. On the Yemeni corner, you can see uh, a yellow strip as well. That, that kind of gives you away that that is the Yemeni corner, okay? Um, now, that's your tawaf. Yeah, so, so between the Yemeni corner and the uh, black stone, you just keep repeating it. Just until you reach the black stone. Again, Allahu Akbar, and then you carry on uh, making your du'as or whatever it was that you want, to, you want to do. Don't make du'as in groups. Don't, because that's really annoying for everyone else. Okay? You'll find a lot of groups doing it. If you do come across a group doing it, you have patience, you know, do your umrah this short period of time. Try to ignore them and do your own, uh, do your own dua. Uh, but it's very annoying, especially when they're pronouncing it wrong as well, <laughs> right? But uh, try to learn the duas and just make it uh, yourself. You don't need to say it out loud. Just make the dua yourself, just like we make dua ourselves uh, normally, right? It says here, try not to take any breaks during the tawaf. Once you start the tawaf, the best thing to avoid any complications is to the whole seven rounds in one go. If Salah enters, right, what do you do if Salah enters? Do you miss Salah? No, you, you pray the Salah. So what you do, you cover your shoulder. Just during Salah, right, Isha Salah is about to start. Right, just get it? 
get your haram, cover your shoulder, face the Kaaba, it's right there. You know, you don't need any app to tell you where the Kaaba is for this. And start khlas, you pray, your Isha. Isha finishes, where you stop, where you stop from, if you, you need to go back a few steps, no problem. You go and then uncover your shoulder again, khlas, you carry on. You just, you just carry on. So you take your break for salah, um, you cover your shoulder, salah finishes, uncover your shoulder, carry on from where you where you left them. Sometimes the women, they send them to the back. No problem. They go to the back, pray, and then they come back, and whatever they were sent back from, from there you just, uh, you just uh, continue. Your left shoulder should always be facing the, uh, the, the, the Kaaba. So whilst, whilst, doing it, uh, whilst doing the tawaf, the Kaaba is here, your left shoulder is always, is always on the side of the Kaaba, not, not this way. Right? So don't be turning around and so on. You need to go back, just don't, uh, let your left shoulder go away from the Kaaba Unless you really need to Like Salah time Then you just come back And from wherever you turn from From there you just continue Okay um, Note Do not waste your time with pictures uh, and talking Obviously talking Don't waste your time with that Umrah is very short Honestly The amount of people that have lists of du'as to make And then Umrah finishes they like, Or Tawah finishes say, That was so quick I didn't get to make all the du'as that I wanted to so um, don't waste your time and again with pictures as well right I know people want to go take pictures and so on but the reality is is that when person starts taking pictures that's when shaitan enters and he makes him want to show off and so on and imagine spending all of that money for you and your family going through all these seminars going through all that traveling having all the issues at the airport your hotel issues whatever issues it may be going through all that hardship just for you to take a picture and destroy all of your reward. Okay? So, um, this picture business, don't be, just forget it, okay? You spend all that time and money, you want that Umrah to be accepted. You want all of those rewards. You want your sins to be uh, forgiven. You find some people, they start posing, making dua just for the picture. He's not making dua, he's lying. Right? All of that will waste uh, your Umrah. So, please, try your best to avoid all of uh, the pictures and so on. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so you, uh, the, all, all of the du'as is that you make during tawaf and sa'i, you can make that in your language. No problem. Obviously, saying Bismillah, Allah Akbar is going to be in Arabic. Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik is going to be in Arabic. A couple of others that are going to come, going to Safa Marwa, are going to be in Arabic. But apart from that, uh, all the du'as that you make, obviously, try to learn the Arabic ones, especially the ones that the person used to make. The, you get the reward of following the sunnah and they're more comprehensive as well. But if you want to make dua in English, or in Urdu, or in Mirpuri, or in Punjabi, whatever you want, you want to mix it all, that's no problem. Just like, just like normal dua that a person does. Right, I've got an issue over here. What do you do if you forget which round that you're on? So you got to do it seven times. You come towards the end. Oh, I don't know. I'm on my sixth one or I'm on my seventh one. A general principle in the religion. al yaqinu la yazulu bishak. Certainty is not removed by doubt. What that basically means is that whatever you are certain upon, that's what you stick to. If you have doubt in other things, you, you, you forget the doubt. You only turn away from that certainty if you are certain 100%. So for example, you don't know, am I my sixth one or am I my seventh one? Am I my second to last one or am I my last round? Right. Certainly, without any doubt, you're on your sixth one. There's no doubt in that. The, the doubt is in the seventh one. Right? You've done, you've done five, and 100% uh, six is there. The doubt is in the seventh one. I'm, I'm on my seventh, I'm not on the seventh. Okay? What does a person do? He sticks to that which is certain, which is number six. In simple terms, you stick to the lower number. Because you're certain, 100% that, that lower number is there. So if you have a doubt, I'm on my third or fourth one. Right? And you're, it's a doubt you don't know. And there's no way of working it out, there's no one with you anything like that, then you stick to the lower number and you continue with the lower number. Same thing goes for Salah. If you're praying a Salah, I'm, I don't know, I'm on my third one or the fourth one, and it's 50-50, you don't know, you're on your third one. You stick to that which is certain. So you should avoid if a person really, you know, he uh, believes that he's going to forget, okay, and there's no one else to help him or anything like that, then there's no harm in a person counting. 
using their fingers. Well, well, one, people, one way that some people do is that they specify a particular type of dua for every round that they're doing. So the first round, I'm going to praise Allah. Second round, send salah from the Prophet The third round, send uh, make dua for my parents. The fourth round, for my teacher and my friends and for everyone else who asked. The fifth, for myself. You know, whatever way they want to do it. Right? So if they remember okay, which duas I've made, it helps them remember which round they're on um, as well. Any of these tricks and stuff is fine. Right. Now you've completed your tawaf. So you've gone, you've completed your tawaf. Now that you've completed your tawaf, you can cover your right shoulder again. Okay? Now what you do, you go and pray two nafal behind Maqam Ibrahim. Maqam Ibrahim is this, this golden thing over here. Okay, that's where Ibrahim Islam built the Kaaba. Uh, and obviously they've built that, uh, this golden cage um, around it, uh, his first step is. You go, you pray two raka'at behind Maqam Ibrahim. Two, two units of prayer. If there's no space behind Maqam Ibrahim, you can pray anywhere in the masjid. Umrah is easy. How many times have I said, if you can't do it, it's fine. Same thing here. There's too many people, right? pray on the sides, pray on the other side. Wherever you find space, just pray two raka'at. Okay? And uh, it's sunnah to recite in the first raka'at, Surah Al-Kafirun, and in the second raka'at, Surah Al-Ikhlas. Qul ya al-Kafirun, and Qul huwa Allahu ahad. If you forget, you recite something else, again, it's not an issue. After that, you can drink some zamzam, and then you head to Mount Safa. Okay, with this, you finish your tawaf. Okay, so remember I said we the summary of uh, of uh, Umrah was what? The summary of Umrah was you do ihram, you finish the ihram. Tawaf, finish tawaf. Praying two raka'at behind Maqam Ibrahim, you finished. If you done three out of the five steps, we're on the fourth step. But oh, this is a quick diagram. That's where the black stone is. Yeah? Um, let me do it in green. So this is where the black stone is. You can see that there. So from here, any any time you're in line with the black stone, uh Allah Akbar, you go around, say whatever you want, say whatever you want, say whatever you want. Once you get over here, which is the Yemeni corner, this part, this is where you say, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasna fi hasana So just this last quarter. Okay, this strip over here. Right, now we go and do Sa'i. Sa'i basically means going between Safa and, and Marwa. As you go to a Safa and Marwa, recite the ayah. Right, which ayah? I've not written the ayah. I didn't write the ayah on purpose. What, why? What, where is everyone going to find the ayah? Yes, al Muslim. Anytime I want to say to you, what's the dua? Right, go to the book Hisn Muslim or any other app that you want to. Okay, or everything's there. The reason I've not, I've not written it here on purpose in case somebody is revised, it's going to force them to download the app or buy the book. Okay? All you do is recite. You don't need to recite the whole ayah, just the beginning of the ayah. Inna safa wal marwata min sha'airillah, which is the beginning and the second just. You just re- so as you're going towards Safa uh, mountain, as you're walking, inna safa wal marwata min sha'airillah. You just recite that once. Which means, verily Safa, mountain Safa, a mountain marwa, min sha'airillah, are from the signs and symbols of Allah. That's the meaning of the ayah. So you just recite that as you're going up. Then once there, you make the Arabic dua and your own dua thrice. Right, what's the Arabic dua? Where are we going to find the Arabic dua? Hasan Muslim, right, good. Okay? It's a bit of a long dua. Okay, la ilaha illa wa sharika lahu mulku alhamdu ala kulishin qadir la ilaha wahda anjaza wahda wa nasra abda wa hazam ala hazaba wahda. You say that dua, so what you do is that you face, you face the Kaaba. Once you get on there, you get to Safa, mountain Safa, you add, you add the mountain. Now there's different levels, any of the levels. You face the Kaaba. On some of the levels, you can see the Kaaba. Uh, even if you can't see it, especially if you're doing uh, work and so on, then there's lines on the floor. Those lines on the floor, if you stand on it, just like we do for, uh, like in Sufuf in, in, in Salah, if you stand on it, then it, it directs you towards the, the, the Kaaba straight. Okay, so if you just stand in line, let's say the line's this way, if you stand like that, right, the Kaaba is right there. Okay? So you just face the Kaaba. You say that, La ilaha wa sharika lahu, till the end of that dua, then you make your own dua. Then you say the Arabic again, you make your own dua. Say the Arabic again, and you make your own dua. You do this th- three times. You do this three times at the mountain of, of Safa. And then you leave Safa and you start to go towards Marwa. Now going to Safa to Marwa, that's once. Okay, don't, not there and back is once. That's, that's way too long. 
Okay, there was, there was a scholar, Ibn Hazm, he, he said he was there and back. And the scholars refuted him and they said, the reason he made this mistake is because he never did Umrah. Allah never blessed him. If he came and did Umrah, he'll realize that. It's, it's not there and back. It's just from Safa to, uh, to Marwa. That's once. Then you come back twice. Three, four, five, six, seven. So where do you finish? You finish at Marwa. You start at Safa and then you finish at, finish at Marwa. Every time you reach the mountains, so we, we did the dua at Safa. Now that once you reach Marwa, same thing. Face the Kaaba, the same dua. Then you come back. Safa again, same dua. The dua you make seven times. I.e., in the beginning of every lap. You know, remember one lap is from Safa to Marwa. That's one lap, okay? So in the beginning of every lap, you make that dua. Which means once you finish at Marwa, do you make the dua or no? No, because you finish, you're not starting anything new. Okay? So at Safa, before you start, that's one. Then two, then three, then four, then five, then six, then seven. At Safa. Your last dua will be at Safa. And then you go towards Marwa. Once you reach Marwa, right, Umrah, Umrah is finished. Only thing left is your, is your haircut. Now there are these green lights. Again, there's, there's green lights. Uh, this obviously, we, we know the story of uh, uh, Ismail and his uh, mother Hajar alayhi salam. They say this is the part where she used to run between the mountains. Okay? So they put green lights there. In, under those green lights, the men can run. Okay? Again, if there's too many people, if you're with family and so on and you can't run, right, you just walk. Or if you're elderly, whatever the case may be, uh, you just walk. Otherwise, if you're able to, then the men uh, can uh, run between these uh, green lights. The green lights aren't exactly in the middle, I think they're a bit close to Safa. Um, so as soon as you come out of Safa, you'll find them. And then when you come out of Marwa, it'll be on, at, uh, towards the end. During Safa and Marwa, there's no specific dua. Just like Tawaf, you can make your own dua, recite Quran, do adhkar, do whatever you want. And so on. And then once you reach Marwa, your Umrah is basically complete. The only thing left is your haircut. Now the Prophet ﷺ, he made dua for barakah and blessings for the, those men that go bold. That they get the razor, muhalliqeen, those that you know, cut their hair with the razor, they go completely bold. The Prophet ﷺ made dua for that person three times. And as for the ones that just trim their hair, the Prophet ﷺ only made dua for them once. So enough is just to trim your hair a little bit from everywhere. Okay, if you do that, it's accepted. As I said, trim, permissible. But if you want three du'as of the Prophet ﷺ, then you go completely bold. Okay? I know men, uh, I know brothers who have gone with me on the previous groups. And you know, you know our African brothers, you know, Allah, they have the massive afros and stuff. And we've had a few of them, and uh, in the whole trip, because we, we go Medina first. <coughs> the whole trip, I'm not cutting my hair, I'm not cutting my hair, I'm not cutting my hair, I'm not cutting my hair. Right? But Alhamdulillah, at the time of the haircut, they're like, Bismillah, let's just go for it. And Alhamdulillah, they, uh, they, they get thrice, the three times amount of the du'as that a person who will just trim their hair get. And if you're doing Umrah, and you don't know when you're going to go again, forget, forget your hair, man. Just, just cut your hair. Go bold and get that du'a, get that reward from the, uh, and that du'a of the Prophet ﷺ. Women, women, they just shorten their hair slightly. Okay, there's no specific amount, you just slightly do it. Okay, so all a, all, all a woman has to do is gather her hair together and just from the bottom just cut, you know, a little bit uh, with scissors and that's it. So sometimes what some sisters do is that they take, um, they take scissors with them in their bags and as soon as they get off of Marwa, just go to the side, grab their hair and, and that's it, you cut your hair and the, the, the women are, uh, they, they've done. Obviously the men have to go to the barbers uh, to get their hair cut. Once you've done that, Alhamdulillah, your umrah is complete. Alhamdulillah, your Umrah is, is complete, right? Quickly, one more time, I'm going to revise the Umrah again, because obviously, if, especially first time you're hearing it, it can be a lot, so I'm going to revise it, and I'm going to draw some diagrams. Inshallah, you'll understand my diagrams um, over Umrah. Okay. The first thing that we do is what? Ihram. The first thing that we do is Ihram. So, you prepare, you have your shower, cut your nails, uh, cut your hair, uh, you can wear perfume, on your, on your body, your clothes, body only, body only, right? Then you wear uh, your ihram, and then before going past the miqat, 
whether you're in Medina, whether you're on the airplane, whatever it is, you make your intention, and all you say is, لَبَيْكَ Allahumma Umrah. If you're doing Umrah on behalf of somebody else, you just add the word An and the name of the person. An Hudhaifa, An Usama, An whoever it is. An means on behalf of, basically. Right? Then, on the way from the Miqat to Makkah, what do we say? The Talbiyah. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik, labbaik la sharika laka labbaik till the end. Okay? Once you start seeing the houses of Makkah and the hotels and so on, you stop. You go to your hotel, you uh, put your luggage down, get ready, freshen up, do fresh wudu, all of that. Then you go to the masjid. You go straight to the mataf area. Once you've entered the mataf area, you uncover your right shoulder, not your left shoulder. You, you uncover your, your right shoulder. Now you come. This is going to be the bedroom of the Kaaba. Okay. Now let's say the black stone is over here. Okay. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. At the black stone, that's when you start your uh, your tawaf. You just if there's a lot of rush from far, point towards it. Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. If you uh, if you're far away, then there's going to be some green lights over here. Okay, uh, on, on the different floors, there's going to be green lights depending on which floor uh, you are on. As soon as you're in line with that, from there you can say Bismillah, uh, Allahu Akbar. Then you you go around, you go around, you go around, you make your own du'as and so on. Then you come here. Which corner is this? The Yemeni corner. Okay, there's going to be a yellow strip there. There's also the the clock tower is literally in line with it as well. That allows you to remember where it is. Between this Yemeni corner and the black stone. What do we say? رَبَّنَا أَتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنًا وَقِنَا عَذَابَ الْنَارِ Okay? And you keep going around and around. And you do that seven times. The first three, if, if the men can go faster, walk fast. They do so. If not, uh, then you don't. Uh, Maqam Ibrahim is over here. This is Maqam Ibrahim. After you do your tawaf, you pray two raka'at behind Maqam Ibrahim. If there's no space, you can pray anywhere. In the masjid, uh, it's no problem whatsoever. Um, there is this part of the, of the Kaaba, some people might see a little semicircle. They call it Hijr Ismail. <coughs> uh, to summarize the story, the history of it, that used to be part of the Kaaba. And then when the, when the Quraysh rebuilt the Kaaba, they had some sort of sharam, you can say, and uh, they didn't want to build a Kaaba with haram money. So they didn't have enough money to build the whole Kaaba. So uh, that part, they left it. That part, they left it. And that's why the Kaaba is not covering that area. And even the Prophet Sallam, he didn't want to change what the people were upon, so he left it as well. So this part is considered part of the Kaaba. It's not allowed for a person to go through it. So there are some doors, you're not allowed to go in it during Tawaf. You'll see people praying and so on. That's for somebody who's not doing tawaf. Okay, you want to pray nafal, you can pray because you're allowed to pray inside of the Kaaba. The person used to pray uh, inside of the Kaaba. But during tawaf, you're not allowed to. Because we said our left shoulder always has to be facing the Kaaba. That means you always have to be outside. Okay, so don't go inside of that. Now with the restriction, I don't know if they open it or not. I don't think they do. But if it is open, then during your umrah, don't go um, in there. Right, once you've Dunya Tawaf, and you've prayed your two raka'at, you go to Safa and Al Marwa. Safa and Marwa is about this area here. Okay? Safa is over here, and Marwa is over there. So you come as you're walking towards Safa, we recite the ayah, Inna Safa wal Marwa min Once we get to Safa, you face the Kaaba, and you make the dua, La ilaha illallah wa la sharika la till the end. Make your own dua, do that three times, and then you go between Safa and Al Marwa. There's some green lights. There's some green lights. In those green lights, uh, the, the men can go fast. You go to Marwa, make your dua again, come to back to Safa. Remember, if you start a Safa, if you do seven, you're going to finish at Marwa. So start a Safa. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You're going to finish at. You're going to finish at Marwa. Once you've reached Marwa, then you don't need to do a dua again. 
your umrah is finished, then you just go look for a baba. There's some babas in the clock tower, there's babas over here, there's different places. Uh, you just go and you get a haircut, and with that your umrah is, is complete. Alhamdulillah. So that is not, that's not something that will take long. The tawaf, depending on the amount of rush, half an hour to an hour. I, I just went about two, three weeks ago, it took me about, I think, 40 minutes, 35 minutes to do tawaf. Uh, Sa'i takes about an hour, that, that takes a bit long. Because that, that's, uh, that, that's a certain amount that's not going to change. Okay? So one and a half hour, you hold your umrah done, then you just look for um, somewhere to, uh, to get your haircut. A lot of the time, what, what brothers do is that they get the haircut in the clock tower, and then just take the lift to the food court and get a, get a munch after that as well. No problem. Um, during uh, Safa and Marwa, you can find people, you know, if you need a wheelchair, you pay them about 20 pounds, which is about 100 riyal, uh, and they'll, they, can, they can push. If you come to Safa and Marwa, if you go to the third floor, they also have these electric uh, buggies that you can hire as well to do uh, uh, sa'i. So, if, you know, uh, grandparents or someone who's not able to, you know, walk, uh, then they can go and they can hire that. And it's permissible. Prophet Sallam did tawaf and stuff on a, uh, on a camel and so on, so it's permissible to do that as well. Uh, you can't eat and drink. You can't eat and drink. No. I don't see people eating, but uh, generally, drinking zamzam -zam and stuff, you see people doing that. That's fine. If you missed it, like I said, then it's, then it's problematic. Then what happens is that uh, normally they send you back to one of the miqats. So if you're going to Jeddah, then uh, there's one. Jeddah is inside the miqats, you have to go outside of Jeddah, which is the opposite direction. Your whole group's going to go towards Makkah, you're going to go the opposite direction by yourself. There's also one near Ta'if as well. So it, it, all, it all depends on your group and uh, who you're with. But you don't want to do that. If, if you feel like you're going to sleep, before sleeping, just make your intention. Make Allah Umrah and then sleep after that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If, like I said, Umrah is obligatory once. You have to do Umrah on behalf of yourself. In the hadith of Prophet Islam, there was a person, he said, and the Prophet said, Who's this Shubrama? He said, He's my relative. And the Prophet Islam said, Do Hajj on yourself first, then do Hajj for a Shubrama. So, same thing for Umrah. You do Umrah for yourself first, then you do it for somebody else. So, for example, if I did Umrah last year, I can do it for somebody else. Yeah, if you've already done it, now you can do it for somebody else. If you've done it already in your life, once in your life, then you can do it. Yeah, so there's an issue of can a person do more than one Umrah in one trip? Now the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallam, like as a Salaf, is that it's one Umrah in one trip. You won't find any of them doing more than one Umrah in one trip. Uh, I asked Shaykh Hitham Sarhan this question. He said, if you're a person that you know that you're not going to come back for Umrah anytime soon, you know, like maybe, you know, relatives in Pakistan, they go once in their life or something like that. In that scenario, it is permissible. You know, it is permissible to go do more, more than one Umrah. Okay, so in that scenario, right, go do more than one Umrah because you don't know when you're going to get the chance again. But as for people that, from the UK that do end up going every couple of years and so on, then the Sunnah is one trip, uh, one Umrah. If a person really wants to do it, then because... During Hajj and Umrah, you have to combine between sacred land and non-sacred land. Okay? So that's why you have to make your intention for Umrah before the Miqat. Because that's not the sacred land. And then you enter. So, if you're already in Makkah, you want to do Umrah again, you can go to a place called Tanaim, and that's where Masjid Aisha is now. Uh, that is the closest area just outside of the sacred land. So if a person does want to do Umrah again, they'd go to Masjid Aisha. That's the Miqat if you're inside of Makkah. Only for Umrah though. If you're doing Hajj, then you, do, you make your Ihram from wherever your hotel is because you'll end up going outside of that land in Arafah anyways. But for Umrah, if you are already in Mecca, you want to do Umrah again, you need to take a taxi, about 30, 40 riyal, to Masjid Aisha. Same thing. The exact same rulings. You go, you make your intention, and you come back and do your Umrah. That's not Sunnah, no. Yeah, Sunnah. So if somebody knows that, okay, I'm going to come, you know, generally, people from the UK, generally, not everyone, but you know, every few years, 
end up going every three years, four years, five years, whatever the case may be. So especially for these people, there's no need for them to go against the Sunnah. The Sunnah of the Prophet of the Sahaba, of the Tabi'een, and so on, is one trip on Umrah. You won't find that they did more than one Umrah on one trip. Only if you like, like an example, you know, people who are from poorer countries, they don't know when they're going to go back. They, you know, some ulama allowed them to be an exception because they can't do it. Otherwise, to just go keep the Umrah again and again and again, no. Even, even the Prophet he never did it. The Prophet only did four Umrah in, in his life. Yeah. 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 You won't find any you won't find anyone who will ever give you a fatwa allowing you to go against the rules. Okay, you won't find anyone who will give you a fatwa allowing you to go against the rules. But the person does it or not, that's that's the different issue. Yeah, so a child, obviously, if a child is under the age of Tamiz, meaning, you know, he's, he's not, he doesn't know what's going on, uh, that Umrah, obviously, doesn't count for him, just like Salah. If a three-year-old is praying Salah, you know, it's not got intention, it's, it's not going to be accepted. But, at the same time, there's no harm in, uh, you know, taking a child with them, teaching them, giving them the experience, uh, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong in that. You know, making a wadi haram and stuff, uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, yeah, so, ihram, ihram. Yeah, yeah, if your ihram gets dirty, you can change it, you can wash it. But if you wash it, don't wash it with anything that has smell. Just wash it with normal water or uh, any detergent or something which doesn't have a smell to it. I I intended smell. You're not to put a pin on the cup. No, you're not allowed to put a pin. You know, because that resembles stitching and so on. Some people put pins on. For a little butcher, for a kid, yeah, that's fine. But for, you got a belt. For the one, you got a belt. Top, no, no. It does come off sometimes, just flick it back over. Uh, go on, Safiya, the Hanif. One trip on Umrah. One trip to Mecca. Okay, if you go to Mecca first, then you go to Medina, then you come back to Mecca, then that's, that's two Umrahs. Yeah. Yes, permissible. Yeah, but the condition is that you use the umrah on yourself first. Yeah, good, good, uh, good issue. The Kaaba does get perfumed. Therefore, during umrah, try to stay away from touching the uh, Kaaba uh, too much. If perfume does go on your clothing, right, then just go get some zamzam, get some water, and just clean it off as soon as, soon as you can. Okay, so my last question, because I've got a few other stuff to take as well. Yeah. Right. What can someone had an ability to do Umrah and he didn't he did lie? And then afterwards he just keep the or whatever they want to do it and they want to do Yeah, they can, they can. They can, they can yeah. Okay. Um, right. Quickly, some things regarding uh, Medina. Um, Firstly, there's no connection between Umrah and Medina, meaning your acceptance of your Umrah has got nothing to do with Medina. You go just to Umrah, you just go Mecca and you come back, it's completely fine. Obviously, if you're there, you want to go to Medina as well. But the point is, is, there's no connection in terms of it being a condition for your Umrah to be accepted or anything uh, like that. The virtues of Medina are many. Uh, we don't have time to go through all of them. The Prophet ﷺ made dua for double the amount of barakah in Medina than Mecca. Uh, one salah in Masjid Nabawi is equal to? No, not equal to a thousand. More than a thousand. The Prophet said, Khairun min alf. Better than a thousand, which means more than, a, not exact, not a thousand, more than a thousand. How much we don't know, but more than a thousand. Okay? Um, the Prophet said, Ma bayna bayti wa min bari min riyad al jannah. That which is between my house, which is where he's buried, you see the green dome? Under the green dome, that's where the Prophet is buried. That's the house Aisha was. So between there and his member, where the Imam stands, Rawdatun min Riyad al Jannah is a garden from the gardens of paradise. So SubhanAllah, a person should try to pray in that area. Um, to now, now after COVID, there's an app called uh, Nusuk app 
for a person to perform Umrah and also to pray there, you have to book it on the app. This is a new rule that they've got. I'm sure if you go with the group, they'll explain it with, uh, to you and everything. Just download the app. It's very simple. Uh, log in. And then if you want to go, just click on Rawdah. Click on the timing that you want to go and you just book it. Um, if, you don't, if you don't book it, then they, they don't. Or if you don't go to the Rawdah, yeah, no problem. There's no problem whatsoever. Yeah, so the ulama differ exactly what does it mean that it's a part of Jannah. Uh, some say the tranquility that a person would uh, uh, feel is similar to that which is in Jannah. Some say it's the barakah, some say it's so on. The, the main point is, is a, the main thing is that it's a virtuous place. That if you can, try to pray at least two raka'at in there. If you can't, it's not an issue. So ladies have separate timings. Ladies, are, I think it's after Isha and maybe after Fajr. I can't remember the exact timing. So the ladies have their own specific timings. Uh, and the men have their own timings. Now on the app, all the timings are there. So you just choose your timing, both men and women, and then you go. Right, uh, what to do? In Medina, uh, the thing to do is that, look, firstly, it's a masjid. So whatever you do normally in a masjid, recite Quran, dua, zikr, you do. Um, but one of the best things that you can do, both in Masjid Nabawi and Masjid Haram, is salah. So increase in Nawafil salah, because the reward is multiplied. More than a thousand in Medina, hundred thousand in in Mecca. Obviously this is subject, subjected to the timings, meaning there are prohibited timings where a person is not allowed to pray nawafil. Generally, whether in Mecca, Medina or here, which is after Fajr until the sun fully rises, just before Dhuhr when the sun is right above your head, and after Asr. These three times it's not permissible for a person to pray uh, extra nawafil. Okay? Uh, some people you know, may not know that, but generally it's not allowed for you to pray at that time. If there's a reason, janazah salah, uh, qada salah, entering the masjid, that, that's permissible. Otherwise, uh, it's not permissible. Outside of those timings, try to increase in as much salah as you, as you can. Also giving salam to the Prophet Now firstly, some people will say to you, go give my salam to the Prophet. Um, there, there's no need for any of that. A person saying وسلم, from here will reach much quicker than a person taking a plane, uh, going to the Prophet وسلم. All that person does is that a person goes, he, he enters. So if you look at the masjid, this is the front part of the masjid. You enter through here, which is Salam Gate, and you go, you go, you go, and the Prophet is buried here. You just go, you face the Prophet. You don't need to raise your hands or anything. You just say, Assalamu alaikum, ya Rasulullah. You know, peace be upon you, O Messenger of Allah. Then you go to Right next to him is, uh, is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. He says it in Arabic. You say, Assalamu alaykum ya Abu Bakr. And then next to him is Umar radiallahu anhu. Assalamu alaykum ya Umar. And then you go. You don't need to stand there. You don't need to make any dua. None of that. You just go face it. Say your salam and you go. Okay? Even, even Umar radiallahu anhu, he used to go. Uh, it's narrated all. He, he would do is that he would go. Assalamu alaykum ya Rasulullah. Assalamu alaykum ya uh, Abu Bakr. Assalamu alaykum ya Abadi. My father. Because obviously Umar is uh, his father. And then he would go. He wouldn't stand there, he wouldn't stay there, anything like that. No, no, Mecca, you go through any. Uh, there's a lot of you go, go through any. From Mecca, you go through any. Okay, so yeah, and you'll come out, uh, basically, you enter through here, and you'll, you'll come out on this side here. Um, what else to do in the masjid? So we talked about praying in uh, roda, the roda. Talked about giving salam to the Prophet. Um, baqir, so the graveyard. The graveyard is on this side over here of the masjid. Um, they only allow men to go in. And it's just like a normal graveyard. You go, you enter, make the dua. Assalamu alaikum, diyara qawm al-mu'mineen, wa inna inshaAllah bikum lalahiqoon. Make the dua. Uh, remind yourself of, of the hereafter and that's it. And then you leave. It's open after Fajr and after Asr. After the other salahs, it's not open unless if there's a janazah, if you follow the janazah quickly, then they let you in. Otherwise, once the janazah is being buried, they, they, they close the door. But as for it being open generally, after Fajr and after Asr.
Yeah. So you see this door here. Let me get a different color. This door here in red. That's the that's the main door where the imams enter from and so on. That's also the gate where the uh, the, the the body enters and exits from. So after salah, the body just comes out and it just goes this way. Now it's a bit blocked off, so I think it takes a bit of a detour, but it's still the same thing. So if you pray in this area here outside or just near the doors, straight after salah, you can actually see the burial going, you can actually try to hold it, and then they let you in and you know watch the burial like you do at a um, graveyard. Um, from the things to do is Masjid Quba. So Masjid Quba is south of uh, Medina, it's just this way. You can take a taxi. They've actually made a uh, uh, they made a pathway now. If you walk at a decent speed, about 45 minutes from Masjid Nabi to Masjid Quba, you can walk there. And uh, the Prophet said that whoever does wudu at home, then prays two raka'at in Masjid Quba, he gets the reward of for Umrah. He gets the reward of uh, uh, whole uh, Umrah. So try to do that. Yeah. If you can't, it's a very nice. The new walkway. Is that if you face it, if you're facing the the, the the Kaaba, it's in front of the Masjid on the right hand side. If you leave there, it's called Jada to Quba, the path of Quba, and there's a lot of shops and uh, you can buy, you can uh, there's, there's food places. It's actually very nice the way they've uh, made it. Um, Shuhada Uhud, so when you, you can go Uhud as well, and then there's uh, obviously the martyrs of Uhud, the Hamza radiallahu anhu, and so on. You go there, make dua for them, remind yourself of the hereafter, and so on. All of the other places in Medina are not legislated to go. So there's Masjid Qiblatayn, there's Masjid Khandaq and so on. Um, there's no reward or anything going to these places, nor do those places look like how they went down the Prophet any, uh, um, anymore. So a lot of people go there, but uh, like there's, there's no extra reward. If you want to, to see the Masjid, it's, it's a nice Masjid, you can go for that. But, but as for actually believing that it's something that you should go, you know, there's reward or anything like that, or I want to see how it was in the time of the Prophet, it's not like that um, anymore. Um, and there's some common mistakes, common mistakes, uh, people uh, touching the walls of the masjid and so on, trying to get barakah, it's not permissible. Facing the grave of the Prophet ﷺ, making dua, not permissible. You make dua to Allah, you don't need to face the grave of the Prophet ﷺ. Um, um, there is one hadith that a lot of people try to quote, is that whoever, I can't remember the exact wording, but along the lines of gain, whoever prays 40 uh, salahs with takbirat al-haram in Masjid Nabawi, he gets such and such a reward. That's, that's ta'if, that's a weak hadith regarding Masjid Nabi. There's a general hadith regarding 40 prayers generally. But the one regarding Masjid Nabi is a weak hadith. Uh, no, these are just some general common mistakes. Yeah, it's a library. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, last slide, which is Janaza Salah. I've added this in because nearly after every Salah there's a Janaza. Not after every, but nearly every. So it's very important that a person learns how to pray Janaza Salah. Okay? It's, and the rewards are many. You know, when you go to Medina, you'll see Mount Uhud. Torah Sam said, whoever prays Janaza, he gets the reward of Uhud. And then whoever follows the janazah gets the reward of two Uhuds. So subhanAllah, imagine after every salah you can get that reward. So you need to know how to pray it. Now in our masajid we don't pray out loud. The Imam recites it out loud. The sunnah is not to recite it out loud. The reason they do it, Ibn Abbas did it, but the reason they do it is because the family comes up to us saying, oh, Imam Sahib, we don't know any du'as. So at least you make a du'a so we can say, Imam, we can say Ameen behind you. That's why a lot of Imams do it. But the Sunnah is not to say a lot. The Sunnah is to do it quietly. And that's how they pray in, uh, in Saudi, Mecca, and Medina. So they don't recite a lot. So you need to know what du'a has to say. Janazah is very easy. Four, you say Allahu Akbar four times. No ruku, no sujood. So you're just standing. Allahu Akbar, Surah al fatiha Allahu Akbar, send salah from the Prophet. Allahumma salli wa salli wa salli wa salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad till the end. Allahu Akbar, then you recite a du'a. Where are you going to find a du'a? Hasan Muslim, right? Okay, and there's many short ones, long ones. Allah makfir lahina maitina, Allah makfir la warhamu, and so many other du'as. Okay, the first few times you might forget, but the more you practice it, you'll get a hang of it. And then Allahu Akbar, salam alaykum wa rahmatullah, and that's it. Yeah, uh, the janazah is 
is complete. So make sure you learn the du'as for janaza before going. Because there's going to be janaza after every salah, you need to know what du'as to say. So Allah Akbar, Surah Fatih. Allah Akbar, send salah upon the Prophet. Allah Akbar, make the du'a. Allah Akbar, salam alaykum wa rahmatullah. Okay? And with that, uh, alhamdulillah, we've uh, completed uh, the seminar, the workshop. May Allah accept all of your uh, umrahs. Any last questions before I finish? Hamusa. If you don't know Hajj or Umrah, Hajj. No, Hajj. I'll send it in the WhatsApp group and the Telegram group. If you're not in the group, then there was a QR code or a number. One outside? Uh, oh, there's, there's number at the back. Okay, make sure you join all the groups and follow all the social media as well. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, just gather all the hair together and just sniff it from the bottom. That's fine, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, for, if somebody's gone for Mashanabu, then they should try to pray Mashanabu. Okay, the, the, the Nafal, they should pray at home. But then the Jama'ah, they'll pray in the Mashanabu, inshallah. No, uh, no, the neck is fine. No. Oh, just, I mean, it's permissible. Uh, not during Salah. Salah should be covering their shoulders. Um, otherwise, yeah, if a person sometimes they've just got the ihram like this, I mean, it's permissible. Like if they're traveling in the coach or something, permissible. Obviously, when you're in public and there's women and so on, they should be covering themselves properly. Okay, good, good question. When leaving Mecca, there's something called tawaf al-wada'ah, the farewell tawaf, meaning the last thing that you do before leaving Mecca is you do tawaf. So let's say you're in Mecca for five days. The first day you do umrah, then after that it's normal. The last day, just before you leave, do tawaf. Okay? For umrah it's sunnah to do, but for uh, hajj it's obligatory, but for umrah it's sunnah, meaning if you don't do it, it's fine. Some ulama have counted it as a as a umrah. Yeah, some ulama have counted it because the hajj is separate. Because you do you do umrah, you come out of your haram, right? Yeah, so some some ulama have counted it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, good, good. So the imam. Okay, you can't see in this picture. There's a sign that literally says the Imam is standing here, don't go in front of it. Okay? Now, we all know that in Salah, you're not allowed to go in front of the Imam. So if you're outside praying, don't pray in front of the Imam. Right? Especially, normal Salah, there's so much space inside. You might have to walk a little bit, but there's so much space inside. Jum'ah, it can get a bit difficult uh, to close the doors and so on, and that, then the ulama will allow it, because obviously you have no other option. But for normal Salah, like, go inside of the masjid, there's a lot of space at the back. Especially if you're facing the, the Kaaba on the left side of the masjid, there's all this space. Because there's no hotels on that side. So there's all this space on that left hand side. No. Oh, yeah, now you have to book it. Since COVID, you have to go through that. Yeah. Even for Umrah, you have to book it, but Umrah, they don't really check, so Umrah is not a big issue. But you have to book it in advance. Try to book it from here before you go, because it does get full quite quickly. And you wear a bag when you're in a state of Islam. You can wear a bag. Can you wear a bag? That's a bag. Fine. <laughs> okay. Zakat al-Khair. Subhanakallah. Allahumma hamdulillah. Shalla Allahu alaihi wasallam. Tasafiru atubu alaihi. Yeah, there's three refreshments in the side room, inshallah. Oh, uh, everyone, just before you forget, uh, before I forget, there's a brother. If everyone can sit down. Uh, sorry, Subhanallah, I forgot. Um, there's a brother here who takes Umrah groups. He's just going to mention uh, some of the rulings, you know, what to do at the airport and all of that technical side, um, inshallah. So, anyone going for Umrah, please listen because it's important stuff to know.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. My name is Shahpal, and I'm just going to give you briefly how to set off from home uh, some tips. Sheikh has covered everything, mashallah, beautifully, and I think there isn't any more questions there. What we start off with is before you leaving home, is uh, you should have your visa, you should have your ticket sorted out, and uh, make sure on the visa everything is correct. Check the passport numbers, the visas, the, the names are correct, things like that must be checked. So once you've got that, I'll just finish this and then you can ask him and maybe he'll be covering it, inshallah. Um, so once you've done that, uh, make sure to have this done, uh, ACWY manager certificate. They used to be compulsory, that used to be that they used to have a look at that all the time when we got to Mecca. But now, at Jeddah or Medina, but now that sometimes they look at it, sometimes they don't. So, but on the website, it still said you should have it. It lasts you three years to five years. So the man ACWI certificate, that is one you should look into. I always take mine. And I've been going since 1993. I always take my certificate with me. After three years or five years, I get it done again. So that certificate is very important. If they stop here, in the Hajj time, when people used to get stopped, they used to give them a tablet or so, but you used to waste two hours, three hours for them to do that. And then you, you're not with a group sometime. Uh, unfortunately, the group's waiting for you. Three, they'll be, just imagine what they'll be saying before, because of you. The coach is waiting for two, three hours because you haven't got a certificate. So ACWI certificate injection, get it here. COVID-19 certificates, they're still on the website, but they don't ask anymore. Uh, so, but the ones I have already have done, one and two and the booster, I still take them with me if I've got them. If I haven't, I do, well, obviously, if somebody hasn't, they don't. But they haven't been asking for them at all. So that's before and doing things. Now at home, when you're setting off for the airport, just make sure you take enough time and make sure you've got your passport. Make sure you've got your passport. You don't want to be turning back halfway and from what away. So make sure you've got your passport and when you now go to the airport in Manchester, make sure you've got your Iran with you as well. There's two th important things. Other things you can buy over there. Uh, even a ram you can buy if you're not going to Jeddah. So if you're going to the airport, make sure you've got your ram, your passport, the main things, that your visa as well. So you leave enough time. Take enough time with you. Plan your journey with enough time. Try to reach Manchester or wherever you're going from, three and a half hours to four hours. At least you're there before and just in case it's really busy. So you plan that. So once you're at the airport, uh, you'll have all the, all the information with you. Try to get into the line and check in straight away if the counter is open. You're going alone with the group, does not matter. Get into the line, try to check in because the e-tickets these days are on your passport. You can check in. Some people check in from home. There's no problem with that. Once you, when you check in, make sure your Iram is in your hand luggage if you're going to Jeddah. Just make sure of that. Seen many people, they've checked in and they turn around and say, oh, I'm going to Jeddah, I've got, I forgot my Iram, I checked that in with me other luggage. So they haven't got the Iram with them and they're going to Jeddah first. So if you're going to Jeddah first and you're going with one of these flights, which are gonna just stop for an hour and a half or two hours, on the way, it's better for you to put the Iram on in from Manchester because you haven't got enough time in between. If you feel you have, fine. But it's better to be prepared and be safe than sorry. You can put the Iram on on the plane as well. There's no problem. But sometimes people intend to want to put the Iram on in Turkey or Milan or wherever they're stopping. Then they're in a bit of a problem. Uh, so it's better to prepare for that. Once you get to Jeddah, be prepared. 
that you're going to be waiting some time. Sometime it's half an hour you're through. Sometime it could take you two and a half hours to get through. So once you're through that, then obviously you're going to get a taxi or whatever, or on a little coach, wherever you're going to go if you're with a group. Be patient. The group can only move fastest, the slowest person in the group. There could be all people on wheelchairs, some children going as well. So be patient. And you will, if you're going with the group, obviously they'll be slightly slow. So onto the coach, do not disappear at the airport. They're looking for you, people are on the coach, and just you are waiting, you're having a burger at Jeddah or in Medina, somewhere in the airport in Medina. Please make sure, stick with the group. So once you're out of Jeddah, the journey takes hour and a half, two hours to Makkah. So once you're in Makkah, get to the hotel, same thing again. You're gonna wait for your keys. Sometimes you have the keys waiting there, sometimes you have to wait. Even if you're going alone, same thing. You get to the counter, you might not get into your room for two, three hours. So be patient and just prepare for this, that this can happen. So once you get to your room, Alhamdulillah, put your luggage down and like then the Sheikh mentioned, you can prepare to go to the, do the Umrah. These are very important things, couple of important things. If you're going to Medina, no problem. Uh, you can put your arm in the luggage, you check in, and you get to Medina, and Alhamdulillah, when you leave Medina after five, six days, or whatever day, days you're staying, then you get to my, the Mekat, put your arm on, or you put your arm on from the hotel. The Medina journey will take you at least five, six, seven hours. It depends how many times you stop. If you're in a taxi, four and a half hours you're there. If you stop half an hour, five hours. But if you're going in a coach, maybe the elder people want to go to the toilet, so on, with a group of people, you'll have to stop a few more extra time, uh, times and I'll take a bit of time. So be prepared for that. When you get to Makkah, same thing when you check into the hotels, what's going to happen in Medina, so on getting the keys, get to the... Once, also remember, if you are using the train, some people have used the train just last week, two weeks ago, rang us up, said, oh, we were gonna use the train, got the tickets, but we got to the train station, half an hour the train's gonna go, but we should have been there 40 minutes before, or 45 minutes before. They were 10, 15 minutes late, train hasn't left, it's still half an hour to go, but you can't go in now. Uh, so they had to get a minibus, 12-seater, to go to Medina, the train from Makkah. Be prepared to go, take enough time to, if you're using the train, get to the train station in good time. On the train, they don't allow you too much luggage. So always check how much luggage you're allowed to take onto the train. So these are a couple of very important things you should take with you, inshallah. Did you wanna? Yeah. Sorry? They used to give you a tablet to eat in the past, but now they don't even ask you sometimes. Mostly, I haven't seen anybody last two years or so, since it's opened after COVID. They haven't asked. Yes, first year when we opened after COVID, they looked at the COVID certificates, the meningitis certificates, everything. But now, this last three times I've been there, I haven't looked at anything, really. Is that okay? Jazakallah khair, barakallah. Yes. No up, yeah. Yeah. It gives you times on it. Once you open it, it gives you time. Yes, you have to keep trying. If there's no slots available, you keep trying all the time. Inshallah.
get your brother to take a start to the laptop and stuff.